It's a great pleasure to introduce Pulkit for his PhD dissertation talk. Uh, the committee is here, at least uh, some in real life and some virtually. Alyosha Efros is right here and Jack Gallant is, uh, is present virtually. So uh, Pulkit's uh, uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree at IIT Kanpur, which also happens to be my undergraduate institution. So this is my first student who is from my undergraduate institution in exactly the same department but 35 years later, I think. Yeah, he is also from the same institution. A very good institution, I might add. <laughs> okay, uh, Pulkit is an is a interesting character. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, over the course of his t uh, time at Berkeley, he's gone through many phases. So there was a time when he wanted to explain the brain. And he was, uh, what I have to say here is he was, he was into deep learning before it was very popular and in my first few years I tried my best to discourage him but I failed uh, and he eventually I, I caught on and I also became a fan of deep learning. But uh, seriously his early work was on trying to show how the representations acquired in deep uh, networks trained for visual recognition provide some explanatory power for the kinds of representations in intermediate layers of uh, sort of the primate visual system. Then he moved on from that to the, the challenge of unsupervised uh, visual learning. I mean, currently the paradigm that we have is training from tons and tons of examples. This is obviously unrealistic as a model of child development because uh, there is no mechanism by which we can inject into the brain of the child uh, all these output labels of ImageNet. Uh, there is, has to be some other mechanism through which the child acquires this knowledge and his uh, uh, title was very catchy which was learning to see by moving which is of course a homage to the great J.J. Uh, Gibson who said that we see in order to move and we move in order to see. Uh, moving on from that, uh, Pulkit jumped into robotics proper and uh, he's done a lot of work which is in the space of sort of uh, visual motor coordination. If you will, I'll describe this work as falling into the category of direct learning of visual motor affordances, which is very much sort of Gibsonian, but Gibson focused just on the visual part, but in fact, the motor part is equally important, so that two have to be learned together. Yeah, he does work on sort of tactile and haptic, yeah. So, uh, uh, so he has written many papers. He has actually run a whole army of undergrads. So there is, the joke is that basically there is a Pulkit University where undergraduates are educated by him, which means that he has great preparation for becoming a faculty member, and uh, which he is hopefully going to do because he has uh, faculty offers both from MIT and CMU, and uh, we will know soon what, where he goes. Uh, and I really want him to do that rather than and resist the siren call of industry in this setting because somebody has to teach the next generation of students. Okay? <laughs> as always, do as I say, not do as I do. <laughs> okay? And this introduction is now long enough. Without further ado, uh, Pulkit Agarwal. Okay. Thanks, Jitendra, for the wonderful introduction. So, let's see. So here I was at the starting of my PhD. This is like <laughs> when I came in, and this is, I guess, the first week at Berkeley. And I think it's been a very interesting journey since then. And this is like my first poster, which I managed to publish after three years. This is like ECCV in Zurich. And this is probably my last poster before this talk, which was in iClear uh, last week. So it's been a very, very interesting and a very nice time which I had at Berkeley. And when I came in, I was all about excited about the brain and how we can understand the brain. And I thought we could put humans in these MRI machines and scan them and try to understand how the brain works and maybe get some idea about it to make computers which can also be intelligent. So what do I do? I come in and I go to Jitendra 
and I ask him, I want to study the brain. And this is what Jitendra tells me, right? It's like consider a computer. And if you could go and measure the temperature of each and every part of the processor, then from the heat map, how, how much could you tell about how the computer actually works? And then I was like a first year student, and I'm like, I don't know, but the brain is so cool. <laughs> so, I was, so I ended up kind of going to south of, not south, but almost west of campus, and I found Jack Gallant. And what Jack was doing was he would take images, record people, their brain activity, and then he had this amazingly cool demo where he was showing people these videos and he was recording their brain activities and from that brain activity trying to reconstruct what the people were seeing. So only from the brain activity he was trying to get to these images. And this was like, at that time I thought it was insanely cool that you could reconstruct the brain patterns in form of images. But obviously the problem was like, when I was thinking about it, that MRI is not portable, right? I cannot take the machine, so I really can't develop a technology which could be useful, because for example, if I want someone to say, speak out his thoughts, he cannot speak, you want the technology to be portable. So I was like, we should do this with EEG. So then I go to Jack and I propose, Jack, how about brain reading from EEG? And and Jack says, it's a great idea, but EEG is mostly noise. So then I'm like, well, but I can still try it, right? I mean, if it is noise. And then Jack was like, well, only a guy from an IIT <laughs> would want to work with noise. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, let's get started. I'm like very excited. It's like my first day and I get this data and I'm trying to work with it. Some time passes. And then I'm like, oh, what's happening with the data? And then it's like three months and nothing comes out of it. And then I'm like, maybe Jack was right after all, that EEG might be noisy. So then again, I go back and I'm like, Jatinda is like, it's like, <laughs> it's like the meeting after spending some time with Jack. I'm like, so he's like, so do you want to explore more neuroscience? I was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And then I ended up working with Bruno for some time at the Redwood Center. And at that time, the Redwood Center was really into these generative models, how to come up with computational theories that explain how brain represents information. And one problem which I picked up at the time was like to do image generation in a way. So you have these images, you want to capture some statistics and then build a model to generate an image. And the question was, can you capture some high order statistics of these images, right? And what I mean by that is, for example, if I capture just the first order statistic, which is just the mean, I would get a gray image because I would average out the black and white and I could capture some more correlations between the data. I could get something like this or I could get something like this. So this is like my best attempt to trying to model this image, right? And at the time I was using this very fancy method which I thought I was trying to use restricted Boltzmann machines and trying to put them with sparse coding. It was really hard to get this to work. And it's truly amazing that now when we see like papers with Gyan, you can get these photorealistic images. Right? It's amazing how far we have come along in like six years, even in this area. And then I'm thinking, well, Nothing is happening in neuroscience. Swami Jitendra was right. And I guess <laughs> what I really wanted to do was to build actual AI systems. So then I'm looking more in computer vision. At the time, this AlexNet paper came out. And as most of you know, that the AlexNet paper on this data set of ImageNet, it kind of broke all records. And then there was a computer vision revolution which happened but I still had my neuroscience cap on. Like I just couldn't get rid of it. So I was like, oh, this convolutional neural network actually looks somewhat like the brain in the sense that there is at least some hierarchy, some like low level processing, which looks like edge filtering. So maybe there's some similarity between the brain and these deep networks. 
So then I was like, oh, I can reuse. I can go back to Jack, reuse this data. So again, like we had MRI data. We, we showed people these images. We recorded their brain activity. And this is like a photo of the brain. So we just represent the brain as a flat map. We just open it up. And then we were trying to compare how well do deep networks end up correlating with the brain. And what we found was, like, so what I'm showing you over here is like each point in this map is your voxel. So what you're seeing over here, V1, is the back of your head. And you're kind of moving forward. And this is kind of moving forward. And on, so over here, you see a convolutional network which has different layers. So what we found was that there was a correlation which exists between, so I have coded every voxel by the color of the network. So if you see, if I go from this direction to this direction, the color also changes. It becomes blue to green to yellow to red. Right? What this was kind of telling was that low level areas of the brain were best explained by lower layers of the con net. The middle levels were best explained by the middle layers, and the high, la high level areas were explained by the higher layers. Now, what I mean by higher level areas are like semantically meaningful areas, some mid level representation, some low level representation. So, this finding at that time I thought was very cool because there was no, I mean, I took an arbitrary network which was trained to do image recognition. People also did image recognition, but there was no reason that the representations should match up even coarsely. But they did end up matching. Yeah. So, is this only the convolutional layers, or you also find correlations to the <laughs> To, so the red ones are the fully connected layers, okay. red and orange. So like the red ones are expected because they're semantic areas. So you would find them. The low level ones are also expected because those are edge filters. The mid level ones end up being quite interesting. Right. And we did this and we did this in a time, so we, it was among one of the earliest works doing this along with Jim DiCarlo. And then there were a lot of works which kind of like, followed this uh, idea of trying to correlate deep networks with brain activity to try to understand the brain better. But what I found more interesting was that what we had done over here was by closing the perception learning loop, we could get representations which were broadly similar in the visual cortex. So maybe if we could close the perception action loop, we could kind of go and understand much more about how representations in the brain work. And I guess the rest of my talk and my thesis is just about building this loop. And how do we go about building this loop? Right. So if you look around us today, right, and there are many exciting systems, like we have computer algorithms which surpass humans at playing video games, at playing Go. We have very impressive computer vision systems. And we have also built these robots, which are very impressive. But if you look at slightly more detail at these systems, if you want to train to a computer what is a zebra, I need to show it a lot and lot of images. In fact, you need to show it millions of images. And how do we get labels for these millions of images is to have humans who look at these images and say, this is a zebra, this is a chair, this is a couch, and so on. So behind every success in image recognition, there exists a human farm. We had a lot of success in reinforcement learning. However, if you look in some more detail, like it was the success came because it was possible to take millions and millions of interactions. Because these games could be done in simulation, and often you will make very, very particular assumptions, such as we know the rules of the game in case of Go. And while we have these robotic systems, which are very impressive again, and can, they can do these somersaults, but these systems can perform this one particular task. Right? So in a way, the AI systems that we build today either work in simulation, in the closed world, assuming some, a lot of knowledge, or require strong supervision and a specific to one task. What we wanted to move towards are AI systems which can operate in the real world with minimal set of assumptions and can perform a general set of tasks. And the question is, how can we get there? So let's consider a task. So a robot sees an image of a few objects kept on a table. And then I give it a next image, which has these objects in a slightly different configuration. And the question is what actions are required to go from this image to this image. A slightly different version of the task is where I show you an image of a rope, 
and I ask you to come up with action so you can go and tie a knot. So let's look at how we can do these uh, tasks with current approaches. So one dominant paradigm is reinforcement learning. And the goal over here is to learn a mapping called as a policy from states to actions. And when we take an action, we go to the next state. If the next state is close to the goal state, we get a high reward. And the task is to maximize the sum of rewards. That is to learn these parameters theta so we can get as high reward as possible. But when we start off, these parameters theta are initially random. What this means is that the agent is essentially performing a random sequence of actions. Right? And what you're hoping for is that by these random sequence of actions, it's actually going to go from this state and tie a knot. Like, how likely is that? Right? It's very improbable that just by random interactions, the agent is actually going to tie a knot. And if it never ties a knot, it will never get a reward. If it never gets a reward, the parameters will never change. So your policy will essentially remain random. This is exactly why these things work in games, because you can take a ginormous number of interactions and hope that once in a while you're going to go and achieve the reward. Right? Moreover, we games, you provide this game score, which provides you these intermediate rewards. Then one more question comes up is, how do we even get these rewards? For example, if I'm in the real world, how do I know is this image a knot or not? What I'll need to do is to build a visual classifier. Right? How do I build this visual classifier? I rely on a human farm. Right? I go and label images and then get this classifier. And if I go and change my goal, I have to go and have one more human farm to build one more classifier. And I'll change my goal again, and the same process repeats again. Right? So in a way, reinforcement learning as we know of today requires lots of data. It's unclear where do rewards come from, and it's very, very specific to one task. But if you just think about it for a minute, right? why, why go and ignore everything that we know and use reinforcement learning? We know the rules of physics that tell us how things are being manipulated. So why can't we just go and use physics? Right? Why start from scratch and do reinforcement learning when we already know how things move when we do actions? Right? So for example, what does physics tell us? Given a state, I have some actions, and what is going to happen next? So then if you want to use physics, the problem looks like that I want to go as close to my goal state xg as possible. I want to infer the actions while I satisfy the constraints of physics. Right? And now this is a very general paradigm because I can easily change my goals and the same paradigm should work. I can even go and have a slightly different task. I can now maybe try to manipulate hammers. Physics should generalize and I should still be able to solve this task. Right? But again, the thing to consider is that physics does not work on pixels. What physics works is on parameters such as mass, friction, and shape. Right? And these parameters are not directly available to us. Where do we get those parameters from? We would say, well, we'll build a computer vision system, which is going to get us these parameters. Right? And this problem is the system identification problem of how to get these parameters. Now, if I have a slightly different task, not tying a knot or manipulating a rope, now you need to also estimate the stiffness. Right? So there's this tedious process which first goes on in trying to figure out what parameters we need to estimate. And after we figure out these parameters, we are relying on computer vision to give us accurate estimates of these parameters. Right? It's been more than 40, 50 years of computer vision, but we simply just don't know how to get these parameters accurately. It is even unclear where do we get the supervision for, for these parameters, even if we have to use all the fancy latest and greatest deep learning techniques. Right? And furthermore, if you have errors in the first part, the errors are going to accumulate through physics, and it's going to be harder and harder to perform the end task. So what we have looked at is reinforcement learning, which works from pixels, and model-based control, which is hard to make work from pixels, but is very, very general. Right? So given these two approaches, it is unclear how do we go towards a task of making generalists or systems which can perform a general set of tasks and still work from raw sensory observations. But the idea of building models is a good one, right? Because models allow you to change the goals and still achieve those goals very, very easily. So 
one insight from one of leading machine learning scientists, Vladimir Vatnik, is when solving a problem of interest, do not solve a more general problem as an intermediate step. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's go back to our setup. So we had our images, we had some vision system producing some intermediate parameters, we're trying to use physics on that, right? So let's try to understand this with help of an example. So I have a feather and a stone, and I'm dropping them from a tower. The question is, will the stone fall first? So one way to do this is to, I have a feather, I'll use my vision system, and try to estimate the shape of the feather in great detail, get the drag, and so on and so forth. Now, how easy is it going to be to get the shape of the feather in detail? It's going to be extremely hard, it's going to be noisy. It's a hard thing to do. An alternative is that based on my past experience, I can correlate that things which have feather-like texture kind of fall slower than stone and use this knowledge to predict the time to fall. Right? Now, this prediction could be much more easier than going through the, the actual physics approach. But the thing is, physics does not really work on quantities such as texture. It works on quantities such as mass, shape, and air drag. So what we'll end up doing is, instead of using actual physics, we'll end up building these intuitive physics models. Right? So we're going to go and sacrifice the generality of Newtonian physics in the hope that we can build approximate model of physics, which are going to be much easier to learn from data and still be able to perform the end task. If my task is to be very, very precise, like nanometer level precision, probably this is not a very good idea. But for a common day set of tasks, this might be a good idea. So the point being, instead of trying to have these two modules, which are going to accumulate errors, let's have this one module and try to learn a joint model of physics from raw sensory data. But then the question becomes is, how do I get this data? This data is just not available to download from the internet. And this is the data which we probably, which we probably need to go and get by interacting with the world, right? So how are, so the question then comes is how to learn such models, right? And the way babies actually end up doing this is by going and interacting with the world for a long period of time. For example, they go poking objects, pushing them, and trying to collect this data. Right? So many developmental psychologists believe that when babies are doing these random interactions, they're just not random interactions. And what they're doing is they're actually conducting a series of experiments to understand how their actions affect the world and then build models which they can reuse in the future to perform more complex tasks. So if we could take the same idea of having agents which can go and experiment and learn about the world, maybe we can try to operationalize this in a form of a robot. Right? And the questions which come up are, the first one is, what is the experiment that we need to run? What is the exploration policy? This is going to generate us some data and then from this data, what is the model that we build? Right? And the constraint on this model is that we want it to be able to solve new problems, learn from few examples, and again, be learned from raw sensory observations with minimal supervision. Right? And once we have this model of how things work, this is going to tell us what to explore next. But there's going to be too much to explore in the world. And sometimes what we learn is biased by observing other humans or other agents. So there'll be some aspect of that. And the fourth question is going to be, where do we start from? Or what is the initial state? Right? So in my talk, I'll kind of briefly touch upon these four questions. And this approach of attacking the problem is what I am calling computational sensory motor learning. So let's start off with the first part, which is learning model of how things work. So to emulate that, we had a robot with just like kids playing with objects, played with objects, kept on a table in front of it. Right, and it did this 24 cross seven without any human supervision. Right? So when the question comes is like, what kind of model should be built? Right, so one natural model to build is, given the current observation and the action, what's going to happen next, just like physics. Right? So one possibility to build this model is to say, I have my raw observations x, and I get my raw observations at time step t plus one, and I want to match these observations in the pixel space. Right? 
And because I'm using a deep network, because I'm using these images, which are high dimensional observations, I'm going to use a deep network to estimate this function f. And I'm going to call this a forward model because this is trying to predict, given the state and the action, what happens next. And there has been a lot of exciting work in building forward models. But the key question to ask is, like, is predicting in the pixel space a good idea? Right? For example, if I have a bottle and if I drop it, what I find is, like, do I actually care about predicting where every piece of glass went or where every piece of water molecule went? Probably not. What I care about is the fact that I should not step on these pieces of glasses and possibly the fact that the bottle broke down. But supervision for things like the bottle breaking and non-stepping on the glass does not exist. Right? So it's kind of easier to predict that the bottle breaks, but much harder to predict the exact location of where every piece of glass goes. Right? So the question then becomes is how to learn this kind of an appropriate feature space or the representation of the data in which we can go and make predictions. So now one possibility is that we rely on the success of deep learning and say, what does deep learning gives us? We have an image, we pass it through, say, a deep network, we get some features. And what we're trying to build is a model which takes features at time step t, and given the action, tries to predict the features at time step t plus one. That is, we can match in some kind of an abstract feature space. So, and we can computationally write it down where let's represent this neural network with a function phi with parameters theta z. And the optimization that we'll be solving is as following. So while in theory, this could work and we could be predicting things in an abstract feature space, but if we closely look at this optimization problem, we find that we could minimize this by setting theta z's to in a way so that all z's become zero. That is, I could represent my data and map it to all zeros, and my prediction problem would be trivially solved. Right? So this is just a trivial way of using a neural network to convert images into an abstract feature space is probably not going to work. Right? So what do we next? What do we do next? So one possibility is instead of trying to predict the images or the features, let's consider a different task of trying to predict the action. Now, why is that? Because action is going to be much more lower dimensional, so it's going to be probably easier to predict than the raw observations. And this is what I'm going to call the inverse model, because I'm going from two images to go and predict the action. And the question is, by performing this task, can I learn some form of useful features? If those features are useful, then I can then go and make predictions in this feature space. So, this is what we looked at in our work learning to see by moving, where we had a car which went around in cities and we collected pairs, it collected pairs of images. The image right now, the image after taking an action, the action and the image after the action. And from these pair of images, we predicted self-motion. And what we found out was that to some degree, these features were useful for image recognition and pose matching. And since then, there has been a lot of work which have stuck with this idea of posing an auxiliary task to learn reasonable features. Right? And there has been work from Berkeley, there has been work from CMU and a lot of other places, using, exploring many different ways of trying to learn feature, features by posing this alternate task. Right? So now that we have a way of learning features, now what we can do is we can go and make predictions in this particular feature space. Right? So we are going to learn the inverse model, which is learning the features, and the forward model, which is making the predictions in this feature space jointly. Right? And the, over here, the z's won't reduce to zero, because the z's were zeros, then we can never be able to predict my own action. Right? So by having this formulation, we have an alternative to making predictions in the pixel space. So the idea being that we have an inverse model, which learns a feature space, and there's a forward model which makes predictions in this feature space. So now let's go back and see how good is this model. Right? So going back to our setup, we had a robot interacting with objects, and what we have are images. The robot does an experiment that just takes an action, and we get the next image. And from this data, we are trying to learn a model of intuitive physics. Right? So the way the robot is conducting experiments is it sees an image, it chooses a point on an object, it chooses a direction in which to push, 
and how much to push. After choosing these parameters, it goes and executes this. It keeps on doing this 24 cross 7 without any human supervision. Well, in some examples, it works as expected. On many examples, if you see, the motion is very nonlinear because the contact between the gripper and objects is nonlinear. So any model which works on this data needs to deal with these kind of nonlinearities. So again, the way our data looks like is I have my image XT, I have an action, and I have the image after the action. And this is showing some samples of the data. I have my initial image, I have my image after. And at any point, there are one to three objects present on the arena, and this is the overall set of objects that we used. And there has been a lot of work, again, in trying to push objects from one point to another point. But over here, the question that we were asking is, can we learn a model of physics or a useful model of physics by interacting with the data? Right. So the question is, how are we going to test this model? One possibility is I have my initial image and I have my goal image, and I ask what is the action that I need to perform? But if this initial and goal images end up being very similar to my training sample, then even if I can perform this task, it doesn't really tell me much because I could have just overfit to my training set. But what about a slightly different task? Now I need to push objects by very large amounts. Right? As a human, it is very easy for us that when we can push objects by small amounts, we can generalize and push objects by much larger amounts. And one hypothesis is that we can do this because we have a reasonable model of physics which helps us do this kind of extrapolation. So maybe if our model can also perform the same thing, it will give us some uh, it, it will strengthen our belief that it has learned a reasonable model of underlying physics. And furthermore, if we can do this for new objects or objects in presence of multiple other objects, our belief will increase even more and more. Right. So now remember, when we were training this system, we only had pairs of images which are one action away. And now we are trying to test with things which, are, which have objects which are very far off. So now what we require is a sequence of actions. So we're going to keep the planner quite simple on purpose because we are, try we are trying to test how good the model is. Right? And the plan is going to be very simple. We take my initial image and I give my goal image. Right? Note that this was never trained with images which had objects so far apart. Right? And then we're going to take the action which the model predicts and then execute this action and get the next image, feed it back, and keep on repeating this process until the model predicts that I should stop. So then the question is, does this actually work? Right. So let's see what happens. We have my current image. I have my goal image. Right. And this is showing the performance of the robot. Right. So what you find is that the robot is able to displace objects to their goal state. Sometimes it is able to correct their pose. Right. And we can also go and test our system on novel objects. For example, here's a soft, fluffy object with a novel texture, and the agent is able to displace them to the correct location. This is one more example of trying to push this red pyramid over here. And again, you find that the system is able to deal with objects of unknown geometry or texture, which it has not seen before. So now, I had been talking about all of this joint forward plus inverse model. But then when I was doing the planning, I just used the inverse model. Right? So what is the benefit of this whole joint model framework? Right? So we can go and experimentally test this. And we can test this on, th on the task of generalization, where I need to push objects by very large distances. So it turns out that if I measure the error in positions, the forward model, the joint model, performs much better than the inverse model. What this tells us that if I'm using the joint model to learn from the data, I get much better generalization. So it's probably learning a better model of the underlying physics. Right. So then one question which might come into your mind is, like, why is this actually working? So one hypothesis could be that what I'm doing is I'm detecting the location of objects in both the images, or the model is internally detecting the location of objects in both the images, and then choosing a direction and the length to push in that. Right. So if this is true, this is position invariant. So if I know how to do this, how to push objects by small distances, I would very easily generalize to large distances if the model actually learned this representation. So did the model just learn this representation or did it end up learning something else? So we can go and test this. For example, now what I have done is I have moved two objects. Right? 
So now, if the model was doing the thing of detecting locations of objects and just choosing how to push from that, what would happen is I would take the location of these two objects and I might average them and try to push over here, right? But what we end up finding, if we run our model, is that it chooses to push one object at a time. Even though it kind of fails in this scenario, it doesn't average its predictions. And so what this kind of suggests is that there's some kind of an internal attention model which, the model, which our model might have developed to push objects individually, even though it might not be able to perform the task always. Right? And here is one example. Again, we can displace the two objects. So what you find is that first, the agent goes and tries to push one object. Maybe it got a bit lucky. And then it goes and tries to push the other object. Right? Again, kind of iterating the same point, the agent is not averaging its prediction, so maybe it's doing something more. But you might be like, well, this is the case of pushing objects. Maybe it's just easy to get some locations and get some heuristics by which it might work. And maybe the pushing problem is also very amenable to this greedy planning. That if I know how to push by small distances, I can very easily push by large distances. But what about this example? Right? Now I give you a current observation and I want to go and tie a knot. Right? Now it's unclear what is the greedy strategy which could work over here. Right? And it's even, and what is the appropriate representation in which the greedy planning could work, right? So we went ahead and tested if our approach also works in this setup. Right? So for example, we have a robot, again, with the same philosophy playing around with a rope. Right? And it does this 24 cross 7 without any human supervision. And now we want to test a model on the task we started off of the task of knot tying. Right? So robot sees the image of a knot it has this current observation, and let's see what happens. So what we find is that the robot is able to successfully go ahead and tie the knot in this case. Right? So the success over here is 18%. It's not 100%, but it's significantly better than chance, which goes to almost zero. Right? So what we are seeing is this kind of extrapolative generalization, where our models can do things or solve problems which they were never trained for, in an extrapolative sense. Right? And what this suggests is that by building a joint forward inverse model, we might be learning a useful model of intuitive physics. Right? But if you go back to, the, to our task, the success on knot tying is only 18%. Right? Surely we can do better than this. A lot of times when humans perform these complex tasks, they do this by observing other humans. For example, over here, observing other human tie a knot. Now, this idea kind of relates to imitation learning. And now let's see how people do imitation learning right now. For example, if I want to teach a robot to do some task, I could take the robot and I can manually move the robot to teleoperate it to perform some task. Right? And in this process, what the robot can get is a sequence of observations and the actions it is taking because it knows how its hands are moving. Right? And I can use this data to learn a policy to perform the task we are interested in. And note that this is also very, very specific to one task, because if I change the setup, I have to give these demonstrations all over again. So what we would like to move towards is a setup where the robot just observes a human perform the task and is then able to repeat what the human did. Right? That is, instead of having ac access to both the observations and actions, I just wanted to have access to the observations. So how can we do this? Right? So one possibility is that if a human demonstration comes in as a sequence of images, in order to imitate what the human showed, what I need is essentially to go from this image to this image, which I can get from my inverse model. Right? So an inverse model essentially maps two images to an action, and then I can use this inverse model and try to copy what the human did. Right? And now we can use the same model to go and try to manipulate the rope in many, many different shapes. This is showing one video of where Ashwin manipulates the rope into S, and then the robot tries to copy what Ashwin did. Right? This is again from this sequence of images. Now, again, going back to the knot tying demonstration, if this imitation is actually helping us, then the accuracy on knot tying should actually increase over what we had. Right? And what we find is that that indeed is the case, and the accuracy goes up to 26%. That means that by uh, watching human perform a task, we can increase the performance of our system. We can also test generalization, and we can go to completely different kinds of knots 
which are different in color, but also geometric properties. For example, over here, the knot is, the rope is very stiff. Still, we can manipulate this into an S shape. Whereas in case of W, the, the rope is so stiff that it's just not possible to kind of push it. So it kind of fails in this setting. Right? So, so what we are doing over here is human gives a demonstration as a sequence of images. And then by using this learned model, we can copy this demonstration. For so the idea being, instead of training a model to do imitation learning, by building a model of how the robot can affect objects around it, imitation becomes a very natural learning mechanism to go and perform end tasks. Okay. So until now, what we have seen is that by doing some form of random experimentation, we can build models which can extrapolate. And with help of some human supervision, in a weak way, they can improve the accuracy on achieving end goals. But what has but what is not ideal is that the robot has been interacting with the world by doing random interactions. So can we go and fix that problem? Right? For example, if I am in a current state, if I just take random actions, I'll end up going to nearby states. Right? But, and then I'll be constrained to my exploration in a small part of the state space. Right? So instead of giving the whole demonstration of tying a knot, like sometimes a human might say that I want my system to go and explore in this part of the state space, right? Or it might say, here's a sub goal. If you can reach this sub goal, you're more likely to go and tie a knot. So if I'm just doing random interaction, that's not possible to go over here just by randomly moving around the rope, right? So can we somehow make use of this weak form of supervision which a human might give, right? And the way we can do this is to say that instead of taking any random action, I want to take an action which goes towards this state. But how do I get this particular action? We're going to rely on our inverse model again. So remember the intuition. When we were looking at pushing objects, even though we trained with objects which are close by, we could go and push objects which are very far off. Right? So in the same way, if we train on some ropes configuration which are close by, we might be able to get actions which loosely move towards the rope. Right? And if this indeed is happening, then our accuracy on knot tying should again increase. And this is essentially what we end up finding, that if we collect data in a way that human has given some intermediate states, and we bias our exploration towards them, our performance can again increase. Okay. So what we have looked over here is that humans, that our agent can make use of human demonstrations to improve end task performance, and also use them to improve their exploration. Right. Now let's look at this model that we have built, the forward and inverse model. Maybe we can improve this and again get our accuracy even higher. Right? So what we had built was this inverse model which maps two states to an action. Right? And we had built the forward model. But the inverse model has one issue. The issue is that if I am between state ST and I want to go to state ST plus one, there can be multiple actions to go from state ST to ST plus one. So therefore, if I have my prediction as this action and ground truth as this action, I can incur a high loss, right? So both actions use the same state, but I can still get a high loss. And this can make training harder. So in one of our works, we proposed a solution to this. And the solution was by making the inverse and forward model consistent with each other. Now I don't have time to go into the solution of how we exactly did this. But what we found was that after making this forward consistency fix, our accuracy went up to 60%. So by making the model train better, we could improve the accuracy. Now, the other thing which this allowed us to do was because we were emulating this multimodality problem, that there are multiple actions that can go between two states, now we could go and train on much longer sequences. Because if I have, say, n actions to go from state one to two, and if I have t time steps, then I become like n, n to the power t. Right? So the multimodality makes training on sequences even harder. So now because we had addressed this problem, we can actually make this recurrent and start outputting a sequence of actions. Right. And we can take the same framework and go, for example, in case of a robot trying to navigate in office environments. Over here again, in the same philosophy, the robot is interacting with its environment just randomly, trying to figure out what happens when it takes some action. Now we can again go and give it some end tasks. Now this robot is taken to a new building, it doesn't have access to the maps of this building, and it sees this current image and the goal image. 
And note that there's no overlap between this current and goal image. Right? So what would a reasonable person do? He would look around and try to find where my goal image is and maybe then try to go towards it. Right? And let's see what a robot ends up doing. It tends to look around and it tries to then go and try to go to the couch over there. Right? And the model predicts when to stop and the robot stops. Again, the accuracy on this is 80%. Right? This is one more example where I have the current image, goal image, little overlap between them. So note that these kind of things could be done by methods such as SLAM as of now. But over here, what we are showing is that we did not require to train the system for anything. This is an emergent behavior of our agent. Right? So what we have looked over here in this part of the talk is that by improving the model, by looking, investigating it, we can actually improve the performance on our end task. Right? So, and in the last part, what we look at is that how can the agent explore what to, what things it should explore autonomously without requiring a human in the loop. Right? So until now we saw exploration was either random or required some human intervention to explore what to do next. So if you look at random exploration, suppose this is your environment, if you're randomly taking actions, I'm going to be constrained to explore in a small part of my state space. Right? What I would like to do is instead of taking a random action, take actions which leads me to newer and newer parts of my state space. So how can we do this? Right? So you are working under this setup that the agent is taking actions and is trying to build a model of what's going to happen next. Right? So now let's consider the agent is at this point and it takes an action which takes it slightly beyond the part of the environment it has seen. Now in this part of the environment, the prediction error of the model is going to be high because it has not got data from that part of the environment. Right? So, what we, so if we can incentivize the agent to take actions with higher prediction error, it is more likely to explore newer and newer parts of the environment. Right? So what do I mean by this? We can go and concretize this. For example, consider this game of Mario. I have my observation, I have my action. Right? So if I do left, the agent goes left, right, the agent goes right, I up, the agent moves as expected. And what we're trying to do is given the observation and the action, what is going to happen next. Right? So for example, in this scenario, if I do the up, the prediction is go up and come down, this is what happens in practice, so everything is fine. But consider a different scenario. The agent comes close to a pipe. This is the first time it has come close to a pipe, so it doesn't really know that there exists a pipe. Right? So when it takes a right action, the prediction it is it should go through the pipe. But what ends up happening in practice, it goes and hits the pipe. So there's a mismatch between the reality and the prediction, and the agent might have more incentive to now keep coming closer to the pipe. Now once it is coming closer to the pipe, now what might happen is that it makes a prediction of when it goes up, it should go up and come down. But what ends up happening in reality is it goes up and it might just be stuck on top of the pipe. Right? So this is how, by just kind of incentivizing the agent to follow prediction error, it can, for example, learn how to climb over the pipe on its own. Right? For this idea of using prediction error as curiosity is something we're going to look in slightly more detail. For there has been a lot of work which has tried to look at the same framework of using curiosity as prediction error. And let me briefly summarize like, how we can computation, like operationalize this approach. Right? So one possibility is I have my current state, I have my next state, and what I'm building is a forward model which goes from state action to predict what's going to happen next. And I can measure the prediction error in the pixel space. Right? But as we discussed earlier, that error in pixel space is undesirable. Like, what we want our agent is to be curious about things that it can affect or things that can affect it. So how do we get this idea and how do we make the agent only curious about those things? Right? So we'll go back and reuse the inverse model framework that we developed, where we take the two images and then try to learn features we can predict the action. Right? And now these features phi only will encode things relevant to the action and will not encode anything else. Then I can go and make predictions in the feature space and measure the curiosity reward in this feature space. So by that I can ignore all the irrelevant things which might affect my own predictions. Right? So again going, so the way we can do this is we have a current state, we want to learn this policy pi, that is what actions I should take to explore. And the way I'm going to get the reward for training this policy is through this forward model. Right? 
and then I'm trying to say take actions which lead to higher reward. Right? So what this means is that I want to take an action that was going to encourage me to have higher prediction error. So it's almost like a game which is being played. And so there's one thing which is trying to learn a model and the policy is trying to break the model. Right? And we can solve this using standard reinforcement learning but with the difference that these rewards are not coming from the environment, but from the agent itself. So let's look at how this exploration policy actually looks. So here's a game of Mario, and what you find is that the agent learns to move forward, jump over pipes, kill enemies, and so on. And all of these behaviors are emergent without using any of the game scores, by only using curiosity of the agent, it's able to make the progress that we are seeing. Right? And then we can take this agent and ask, is this policy specific to this environment or does it transfer? So you can take the agent's policy trained on one level and then drop it on a different level as is, without any fine tuning. And what you find is, even though it has not seen these objects or ducks before, it can still generalize to these new environments. And we can take the same framework and again go to the case of navigation, this is first person obs observation of the agent. And what you find is that if you're doing random exploration, you might just go and get stuck near a corner. But if you're doing curious exploration, you tend to move along corridors. The reason for doing this is that if you want to go as far as possible in the game, then you should learn to move along corridors because that will take you as far as possible and that is going to maximize your prediction error or curiosity. Right? And what we can also show is that if I have some parts of the environment which I do not control, for example, random noise over here, which is very hard to predict, we're going to completely ignore it and not become curious about it and still make progress. But if you are measuring curiosity in the pixel space, that doesn't happen and the agent gets confused. Okay. And again, in the same line of thinking, we have a training map. We want to now gen see if things work on a testing map. So we take the agent trained in one environment, again, just with curiosity, and we can drop it to a different environment. And what we find is that the agent displays this exploration behavior, where it goes inside a room, comes out, goes inside a room, and comes out. So these exploration policies that we have learned actually generalize to near environments. Right? So these exploration policies, which are learned using curiosity in pixel space, do not work as well, but learned in the feature space end up really generalizing. Now for more details, you can look into the paper. Right? So what we have looked at now is how the agent can self-supervise its exploration, the better it's going to explore, the better models it's going to build, right? And, and defining curiosity as prediction error is one of the ways to, ex, to have how an agent can explore. There are many other ways in which people have proposed to use curiosity, and we have some work looking into it, but again, I'm not going to go into details of it, right? Just like, we have been in this talk building models of how to interact with objects. We also might want to build models of how to interact with humans, right? So we have some work in which we looked at, for example, if we have a game of water polo, and I look at this particular player and ask the question, to which player will he pass the ball next, right? After the ball is in the air, it's all about physics. But before the ball is in the air, you might need to reason about who is in your team, what are some team strategies, and so on and so forth. Right? Again, I'll not go into the details, but I'm happy to talk about this after the talk. Okay. So what we have looked at is some ways in which we can have an agent discover what experiments to run next. Right? So one thing that we found was our curiosity-based work in is in simulation right now. We are trying to transfer that to the real world. Now this curious exploration provides us just the data which helps us learn model of how things work, right? And we build these models which could solve new problems such as in case of pushing objects or manipulating ropes. They could learn from a few examples, just, for example, just by seeing a single visual demonstration and they were trained from raw sensory observations, right? And now some potential concerns are that our uh, setups were quasi-static, the tasks were potentially short horizon and we use some predefined motor primitives. These are some things that we are working towards at this point. Right. So now this kind of builds the core framework where I explore, I learn a model, and the model then tells me what to explore next. Right. But again, as we started off saying there's going to be too much to explore, we looked at some work on how 
we can make use of human demonstrations to either improve our exploration or to improve our end task performance. In this work, what you have considered is first person view imitation, and we are trying to move towards third person view imitation. And the last question which came up was, what is the initial state that we start off from? So what we build it up in our agent was to build forecasting models. There are many other things one could build in, and some of our recent work is looking into it. So this whole framework, again, is what I'm calling computational sensory motor learning, because it's reminiscent, in a way, of biological sensory motor learning, where babies start off with doing some, for example, trying to first move their hands. Once they know how their hands move, they might go and try pushing objects, poking them, and then eventually trying to throw them. And there's a gradual process by which learning is happening, and the same gradual process is what we are trying to capture. Right? So in the long term, I believe that the answers to intelligence will be found by robots that explore and conduct experiments in the real world. Right? And what we have been proposing is like one framework to go and try to go towards that problem. And obviously, there are some problems. For example, we just don't have robots which could be mobile, which are not fragile, because we don't want the robots to break when they're conducting experiments. We want them to be safe around humans. We might want them to have a lot of different forms of sensing, do dexterous manipulation, and hopefully be low cost also, so that we can deploy them at scale. Right? But there is a lot of hardware out there, but none of these hardware satisfies these criteria. But I think we have a very interesting opportunity in this world of machine learning, because the way we have been constructing hardware until now is to say, this is the physics, this is what I know how to control. Right? So I'm going to build a hand with a motor and a rigid manipulator and try to move my hand. But if I can relax this constraint and say I can use many interesting materials, and even if I don't have an analytical model, but I can use machine learning to build interesting mechanisms. For example, I could have a soft robot, which is compliant. It could be safe, low cost, and non-fragile. I could put some non, highly non-linear over-actuated control mechanisms for which I cannot build analytical models, but I can still control them using learning techniques. And I can also use sensors which are not super precise, but sensors which are a ton of sensors which are potentially cheap. And I can accumulate information from all of these sensors to get the same functional utility. And then we can go and deploy this robot at scale. Right? So we have been doing some works looking at, for example, how can haptics help in grasping objects? How can we control nonlinear actuation mechanisms? How can we work with low-cost robots for doing things like grasping? And then again, one of our test beds where we had a curious low-cost robot, which, were, which we were recording the video, the audio, we gave some objects to play around with to see what all things we can learn. Right? And these are some steps towards trying to go towards the agent which we can actually deploy. So in words of Alan Turing, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not build one which can simulate the child's? And I presented one initial steps of one approach of going towards that. And this kind of comprises my PhD thesis. And on the way, we were also able to do some other works. For example, we were able to start this effort of trying to use computer vision to solve some problems in dementia care. This is just a photo of our team some time back and you're doing some bowling. And I'm very thankful to a lot of people whom I was able to learn a lot of things from. Bruno, whom, whose office I used to go and sit for three or four hours, just chatting about neuroscience, and he was just very open and he gave great feedback. Then Tom, with which I was finally managed to write at least one cognitive science paper, having failed to write a neuroscience paper. Then. Alexander Bayan, who was involved in the dementia care part of things, who was, again, very insightful. Trevor, and then finally Peter, who really kind of helped me bootstrap into robotics. Then Jack, with whom I spent a lot of time. And he told me that he has never had an engineer write a neuroscience paper with him. And I guess the same will hold true even after I graduate. <laughs> <laughs> But 
I mean, it was great working with him. Like, I think I learned a lot about how to just do science, how to conduct experiments, how to write papers. Like, he used to give me drafts. I would send him a paper. He would cut every line, every word, and give me back a, a document which was completely different. And we did like 50 iterations of it, but it's still going. <laughs> then, of course, Alyosha. I guess when before, there was a difference, I would say, before Alyosha and after Alyosha. On the seventh floor, I think things completely changed. <laughs> yeah, and Alyosha is just like a senior graduate student. <laughs> He's always there. <laughs> yeah, and then finally my advisor, Jitendra Malik, who was always very supportive of whatever thing I wanted to do, I would go to him and say, I want to do this. He was like, sure, go ahead and do this. I think without that support, like I think none of this would have been possible to just go and try out whatever I wanted to do. I think everything was made possible by all the great faculty that I could work with. And then Berkeley also had this tradition of having great postdocs, right? So we had Ross Gershik when I was in my initial years, who was responsible for our CNN. If you want to learn how to conduct experiments in computer science or write machine learning papers, I think there's no one better than Ross to learn that from. Then there was Katrina. So in my life, there was a time where I would go back home before 6 p.m. And then once I started working with Katrina, it switched to 2 a.m. <laughs> but again, so she brought in a lot of energy into the lab. Then I ended up writing a paper with Amir, which was also a nice experience. Again, trying to kind of really get to like what experiments one should conduct to tease out some particular thing. Then Philip. Then, of course, Sergey who was then a postdoc, now as a professor, but really helped me set up all the robots and all the robotic stuff that we were doing initially. And then finally, Joao. And I mentioned Joao because like at the end of my third year, nothing was actually working. And I was like, nothing is working. I'll go to Joao's office and he was like, don't worry. It will all be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and just his like, spirit of, yes, it's fine. Just, just do it. And just don't think about it. <laughs> So it was, yeah, I mean, it was really nice. And then, of course, a lot of graduate students. So these first three are from Jack's lab, whom I spent a lot of time in my initial years. Then Parsa and Evan, who were co-authors on some papers. Then Bharat and Saurabh, whom I had a lot of good discussions with throughout the time I spent at Berkeley. And then Shubham. And we would always fight, like whether to use 3D or not 3D. <laughs> I think that question is still unanswered, but it's all been a lot of fun conversations. And Brian Chung, who was from the Redwood Center, again, a lot of nice conversations, starting from neuroscience up till now. Then Rachit and Pana, with whom I ended up writing papers. It was, again, a very nice experience. Finally, Tingui and Shiri for all the crazy things all the time across the bay. <laughs> Mayur, with whom I spent a lot of time discussing a lot of ideas. I mean, I guess we should get an award for most number of failed attempts. <laughs> and then finally, Deepak. I think all of my papers in the last year were with Deepak. And I think it, he, he had a really nice thing going and kind of working together. And then after graduate students, I think Berkeley also has a lot of undergrads. <laughs> so here's Jacob, my first undergrad. He is now at CMU. Uh, Ashwin, who is now a PhD student at Berkeley. So he helped, again, all the robotics experiment was started. Then Dian, who is, I believe is now going to UT Austin. Now Fred, who is going to join MIT next year. Then we had Jeff, who was working on some medical side of things in relation with UCSF. He is going to join UIUC. And Michael Luo, he is still a sophomore. <laughs> and then finally, the robots, without which <laughs> none of this would be possible. And this would be incomplete if I do not acknowledge the Valerhona Reinforcement Learning Grant, <laughs> which kept us alive for doing chocolate-driven exploration at 2 a.m. every night. <laughs> for this grant, which is in form of chocolates from Alyosha, <laughs> went behind the Curiosity paper, the Human RL paper, and the Zero Shot paper, and a lot of other fun discussions, including Great Cupid. 
Now, yeah, and then the other fun thing which happened was the sensory motor rendezvous reading list that we had. I guess it was just another way of having cheese and wine and doing some philosophy, right? And yeah, and I guess with that, I'm ready to take any questions. <laughs>